Welcome to the Good Life, Great Careers podcast, episode number three. My name is Caitlin Betts, and I'm the Director of Talent Acquisition here at the state of Nebraska. I am joined today by my co-host, Brian Savick, the Director of Workforce Training and Development at the state of Nebraska. The state of Nebraska is a great place to start or grow your career. Many people don't realize that Nebraska state government is one of the largest and most diverse employers in the state when it comes to career opportunities. Uh, Currently, we have around 600 job opportunities posted with Nebraska state government, ranging from positions with corrections, public health, game and parks, law enforcement, nursing, public relations, office management, just to name a few. I could go on and on. Really, in Nebraska, the opportunities are endless. Stay tuned until the end of this podcast, and we'll share some information with you about how to find and apply for those opportunities. We're really excited um, through this podcast to help raise awareness about the great careers in the state of Nebraska. Each episode features a different state teammate, as well as our Um, excuse me, as our guest uh, to tell us about their own career journey in public service, providing some insights and tips, as well as perhaps maybe even share some opportunities currently available within their state agency. I'm really excited for this episode as I think our listeners are going to enjoy hearing from our guest, Gloria Eddins. Uh, She's with the Nebraska Department of Administrative Services. Gloria is the business manager for the 309 task force, as well as the ADA coordinator for the state of Nebraska. Gloria, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about yourself so our listeners can get to know you a little bit better. Who is Gloria Eddins? Well, I'm Gloria Eddins. I've been with the state for 18, 19 years now. Uh, 19, I think, at this point. I... um, work within the 309 task force, which is a tiny little division within administrative services. And in short, we take cigarette tax and repair state buildings. So that's the short version of what I do. Um, I've been, I started my career with Game and Parks Commission in an entry level accounting job. I got out of college and I had no real world experience, um, just with an associate's degree at SCC. I never did get my bachelor's. And um, they had an open accounting position, so I grabbed it. And from there, I've moved up slowly but surely through um, to a staff assistant and then moved over here to uh, the business manager position. I'm a mom, I have four children, I have three grandchildren. Uh, I'm active in city government to some degree. I'm on the planning commission for the city of Lincoln and um, active in my neighborhood and in the school system for whatever they happen to need. And the state allows me the flexibility to do all that. Um, You said you've been with the state for 18, 19 years. Have you been with Department of Administrative Services that whole time? Uh, No, I started with Game and Parks um, at entry level position. I was in their permit section. I was issuing issuing hunting and fishing permits and data entering them into a system and doing the accounting for that. I moved up um, into the parks division doing their budgets. So I ran budgets for all the parks in the state of Nebraska. And then uh, moved to the engineering division. That's where I first got my hands dirty with construction type projects and ADA compliance for buildings. Um, I happened to use a wheelchair. So if something, if they were redoing something in game and parks for wheelchair accessibility, they come up to my desk and say, hey, does this work? Because game and parks is its own beast and um, getting somebody into a kayak from a wheelchair is different than having to use a bathroom in a building. So they'd come up and ask, hey, does this work? And we'd look at the law and say, well, yes, it's compliant. And yes, it'd probably work for me and probably most people it would work for. And then um, at that point, we used 309 funding to fund a lot of our building repairs. And they had an open position that was a counterpart to me at Game Parks. And so somebody said, hey, Gloria, you need to do this. It's on the other side. And it was a significant pay increase. So, yep, I'm in. (laughs) So I put in. So that was about eight years ago that I joined administrative services under the 309. And I've been here since. I think you've really highlighted one of the great things about state government. There is just so much opportunity. Uh, I have kind of a similar story of starting in one agency and moving to another. Um, Tell us what that experience was like for you. It was really um, pretty smooth. I I moved numerous different divisions within Game of Parks. I was in three different divisions at Game of Parks, and they're such a big family anyways that it was really easy to switch, and you still help the old job because you're still one state in Nebraska, right? And so when I came over to 309, because now we're funding stuff at Game of Parks, and because I knew all their parks' budgets, and I knew the struggles they face, I really had a passion to say, hey, let's get them the funding they need to preserve their buildings as well as a lot of the other agencies. 
Um, right out of college, I actually did do an internship at Department of Corrections for a year at, in their engineering division as well with construction. So I also had enough knowledge of, of Department of Corrections to really say, hey, their buildings need work. These are some of the priorities and struggles they're facing. Um, so getting that all around picture of state government when you're in administrative services where you serve all state agencies was such a benefit coming into this position. So you talked a little bit about your journey, you know, coming out of college and then into the workforce. Were you were you intending? Did you want to have a career? Did you think about that with state government in the public sector or? So my mom worked for state government for 20 to 30 years. Don't quote me on that. She retired from state government. And one of the things that I always awed at was the fact she had leave. If she needed a day off, she took the day off. Because after you've been with state government, I would say about 10 years is when it starts to teeter of, oh my gosh, I have so much leave. Um, that I really, because of having young children at home, um, we did foster care for a good number of years. I needed some flexibility to be able to, if I need a day off, you need a day off. It's that family work balance that I knew the state would provide. My husband had a decent job, so he was making okay money, and we needed health insurance more than anything in the world. So, and I had done, I had worked with um, some nonprofits for a while, and uh, didn't, being a bean counter and a no bean organization was always kind of difficult. So I um, kind of looked at state government as they have the health insurance that I needed at the time and the flexibility for family work balance. Yeah, you hit on a few things there that I resonate with me and I, and I think is um, a great draw to working in the public uh, sector, specifically state government. Um, you know, it's I've had conversations with with my boss, uh, Kevin Workman. He coins uh, these three C's of compensation, culture, and career progression. And while the state may not always be on the same level in the, as the private sector when it comes to compensation, um, when it comes to culture and uh, career paths, we are very competitive in that field. And when it comes to the leave, I've my, that's been my experience too. Work-life balance is fantastic. Um, very generous with the leave and then health benefits too. A couple of years ago, I actually went to the private sector and um, our family went through some health issues and it was thousands of dollars of difference between what we ended up owing under that. And I was thankful for our insurance, uh, you know, that I had in the private sector, but it was nothing compared to what I would have been with at the, with the state at the time. And so that's one area where I think the state really competes. So I, I'm just glad to hear you say that. And, and, and I think that's something that people maybe don't factor in when they, when they're only looking at the comp compensation piece of it. Yeah. That health insurance was huge for our family that the husband's job didn't provide at a affordable rate health insurance. We had to have something that could provide for the whole family. So tell us, and <laughs> this may be a difficult question, um, uh, but tell us what a typical day, there's probably not a typical day, but if there were a typical day for you, what would, what would a typical day look like? So I kind of have uh, multiple different, um, I don't know if I call them jobs that have been combined into one or, or, or I'm very segmented. I kind of have three different areas that I focus on. So lately I just kind of picked up doing, our training coordinator had left and we kind of made the decision that do we need to fill this position? So we're kind of on hold on if we're going to fill it. So I've picked up and I'm learning all sorts of great things about training. So part of the 309 task force is when it was set up in 1977, the legislature said we need to do something with our buildings. They were falling apart at the time. And um, they came back and said, well, that's great. We're fixing the buildings. But if we don't have people in that building that can take care of those buildings, um, what are we doing? So they set aside money to train specifically maintenance personnel in the care of their buildings. Another great state benefit is the training. Um, so I've picked up that recently. So whether it's an electrician that needs electrical hours, we have somebody who wants to learn welding. We just had a class for Game and Parks. Um, they wanted to learn just how to fix their grills and picnic tables. They didn't need a certification in welding. They just need to know how to fix what they got. So we set up a training for them to just learn how to put a weld that's going to stay and to stay. So when you go to the gate, game and parked to one of their park areas and the grill opens and shuts like it's supposed to, that's due to that welding class. So that's something new I've picked up. So I get a lot of requests for training and setting those up. Um, and that's a daily event that I'm going to probably get somebody looking for something to learn to better their career. Um, my former predecessor that was in this position before I picked it up always said, you know, if you had to apply for your job today, would you get the job? 
And if the answer is, I don't know, maybe we should get you some training. <laughs> so, like and it's that. free to those employees. I mean, who, who can walk away with, now you know welding and electri electrical and sewage and you're, a water, you're certified in water treatment. All these different things, we can provide that for you for no cost. So that's my new duties. Um, and then my main one is doing all the contracts and invoices and payments for construction projects across the state. With cigarette tax, we get $9.1 million. Plus, we have another funding for the, the agencies that pay rent. We have some more funding for that. And so we use that money to fix roofs and to fix HVAC systems and windows, anything with the building itself. We don't necessarily make things look pretty. If we redo something, we're going to get it top quality. We're going to have it energy efficient. We want it to pay back the state with energy savings in a short amount of time. But so I process all the paperwork associated with that, getting people paid on time, getting those contracts signed and uploaded to meet state purchasing guidelines. That's what my main job is. And a few years back, um, we the state didn't have an ADA coordinator, which is mandated by federal um, regulations. And so um, our agency took the lead on that uh, Department of Administrative Services took the lead on that and somebody within employee relations had the position and she was fabulous and she happened to move on to private enterprise and she came to my desk and said will you take this on she knew I was passionate she knew I knew the ADA law in relation to buildings because my day job as I call it could fund those repairs and so yeah I became the ADA coordinator for the state the state was gracious enough to send me to all sorts of training to make sure I knew all of title one title two and title three of the ADA and so now I get complaints if the state of Nebraska is not compliant with the ADA those funnel through me and we get them fixed just as fast as we can we also provide a little bit of education to our agencies on this is the best way to do things I'm also a huge resource whether it's an architect building something in an old building that they're not sure how to make it work. Um, even Game and Parks once in a while will call and say, hey, how can we do this still? Um, just a resource to reach out and say, how do we do this best to fit the needs of the uh, disabled community? That was my day. <laughs> it is a busy day. Yes, I was going to say, wow, your day must be packed from when the moment you get here to the moment you go home. Well, you mentioned a lot of amazing things that you're responsible for, um, and I just wanted to um, really emphasize what you said and the state provides great training. So it's really interesting to hear how you help coordinate that for people out in the field. I would have never thought about the picnic tables and the grills and those kinds of things. So next time at the state park, I'll be thinking about you and, and appreciating your efforts <laughs> right. there. Um, so with the, with your role as the business manager for the 309 task force, what kind of construction projects are they working on? Just um, maintenance or, or what does that look we like? We have such a huge diversity in projects. So the 309 task force can cover four main areas. We can do your deferred repair, which is windows, roofs, HVAC systems. We can do energy conservation. So right now the state office building on the fourth floor is getting all new LED lights. And the money on the, the payback on those is such short time that we'll recoup that money and the amount they're paying out in utilities. We can also do fire life safety. So if you get a code violation or you even know this building needs to be sprinkled and the sprinkler system isn't working or it hasn't had one, we can fund that. And then we can also fund those ADA barrier removal type of um, problems within a building. So we run the gamut from Game and Parks is one that will do smaller projects and a lot of times their staff will do the work and we just pay for the shingles to go on the roof and their staff puts it on. Or we have the huge multi-million dollar um, electrical project at the state office building because it was just outdated and somebody couldn't plug in a microwave and run a toaster at the same time without blowing a circuit. So we're redoing most electrical. So they really run the gamut. We've done, we do university and state colleges. We have a lot of roofs going on for the university right now, which is so important for your building infrastructure is to have a good top. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most interesting project that you've seen come across your desk? Um, you know, one of the ones, Chimney Rock has an itty bitty little visitor center out there. And they have 90 to 100 mile an hour wind out there. And then sometimes you put hail in that wind. And it, the building takes a beating. So your aluminum siding that everybody loves to put up is not going to hold up to 90 mile an hour hail coming at it. So we ended up putting um, stucco back on this building because it holds up better. And when we tore it apart, there was bug damage. So we had to fix all of that. I, for some reason, that one really kind of interests me just because of how are we going to make this work for 
for this facility. We also have a lot of historic structures that we're trying to make accessible to the public. So how do you take a building built in the eight, late 1800s and make it accessible for somebody using a wheelchair? How do we get them into the building without taking away from the the historic nature of the building. So with your role as the ADA coordinator, what is your involvement with those kinds of projects and helping make sure they are accessible? Um, we have an architect on staff that reviews all the plans, but he too will ask, what do you think of this? Is this going to work well for everybody to get into the building or to use that building? And just um, when we go on inspections, so we inspect buildings every other year prior, right after the biennium budget is put in, we start to prioritize all our budgets because, of course, we don't have enough money to do everything that's on the list. We'd love to, but we don't. Um, so we try to prioritize on what's the most need. And when we're on site with those people from that building, it's really easy to say, hey, you know, this would be an easy fix to make this accessible. Why don't we do that? I love hearing your passion, um, uh, especially for the, the AD, ADA side of things. Uh, first of all, I'll put a plug in for the visitor center at Chimney Rock. We went there a few years ago on our way up to the Black Hills and phenomenal. It's a great building, great center. Um, you know, and there's things that people don't think about as far as like the historical buildings, you know, and, and that's a passion of mine because I was a history major. I love history, but yeah, you know, making that accessible. Um, and just as you've spoken through about your role and, 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 uh, what you do, uh, in your, uh, various hats that you wear a lot of passion. What would you say if you had to pinpoint maybe one thing or one or two things, what's most rewarding, what's most fulfilling, what's your favorite part of, of what you do? The small wins are probably my biggest thing. Um, we had someone trying to access a lake, Lake McConaughey. It's a huge lake, a lot of beach. Um, their son is uh, paraplegic and was having trouble accessing the park. So I was able to work with that park on how can we get this kid down to the water. And they called back and said it was an amazing experience and the son had so much fun. Those small wins, um, even when a, an agency is struggling with a building on what do we do with it and we can come up with the solution and the money when they were saying we didn't know what to do, we don't have that kind of money in our budget. Those little small daily wins. So do you have, is it primarily agencies that are reaching out to you or do you hear from the public as well? Um, the ADA coordinator side, I hear from a lot of the public. Okay. Um, and a lot of times it's just, who do I call? They, they Google ADA coordinator or ADA state of Nebraska and they find my name. I don't have any, I don't have any jurisdiction over anybody. I don't wear a cop and I don't carry around a ruler <laughs> to smack hands. But if they call me about a private entity, I'll reach out and call that private entity. I have no jurisdiction over them whatsoever. But sometimes just a phone call to say, hey, you know, this doesn't necessarily, you're, you're not helping the disabled community as you could. Sometimes it's just that phone call and it's corrected. Other times I get nowhere and that's okay. Um, but with state agencies, I usually reach out. Most agencies also have a state, uh, have an ADA coordinator. And so a lot of times I just reach out to that ADA coordinator and say, hey, we got, um, I like to call them requests for service. <laughs> um, and um, I'll reach out to them and say, hey, I think we could do this a little better. Or how can we make this uh, constituent or person life a little bit easier? And we get a lot of progress with that on the positive side of things instead of always being negative. Yes, it sounds like there's a lot of um, rewarding aspects of your job. What would you say is um, the most challenging about your job? Um, well, I think, you know, we're, we try to be uh, the best we can with the money given to us. But my list is long and you really want those buildings to be in the best shape that they could possibly be. So I think at the end of the day, the um, just not quite having enough is probably always a struggle. And it's the same with the ADA side of the job. You know, if I had a magic bucket of, of funds that I could do some of the stuff, I, I know we could do better on things, but we do the best we can and we make huge progress with the money we do have, but that's probably the struggle. What would you, what advice would you give somebody that is looking to make their building more accessible? Where, where would they start? You start at the parking lot and, and just, Take a chair and sit down for a moment and look, can I reach stuff? Can can I get in your front door? Can I talk to the people I need to talk to? And it's those little things, if you just change your mindset for a moment, you know, um, do I have proper signage? Yeah, and I, I love that and because a lot of times it's not malicious, right? It's just no. not, a, it's a lack of awareness and, and, and putting yourself in that place. I know being in the training field, coming from the private sector into the public sector, um, 
and learning about being 508 compliant, making sure our training is accessible, uh, that it has captioning, closed captioning, you know, that was new. And, 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 and once I started to learn more about that, the, the, the importance of it, where before it just hadn't really not, you know, consi- not considered it because I wasn't aware of it. And then, and so just that awareness and putting yourself in their shoes and, and understanding their, you know, situation. Since I started this, the ADA coordinator, which I think three years, maybe don't quote me on that. Um, my number one complaint is not having closed captioning on videos. And for the most part, it's somewhat simple to do. I'm not saying it's not time consuming, but my understanding is it's not, it's not horrible. And that's the number one complaint I get within state government is that we're putting information out there that not everybody can access. So if you think about that, of the information you put out or your website or your phone app, you know, is it compliant? Do you have somebody on staff that knows how to check it? Um, And I always say, if you don't know, ask. Um, You know, we don't know what we don't know. And so if you ask the question, I'm not going to be offended by being asked, does this work for you? I'd rather have that be asked than it not work for me at all. Yep. Yep. And that's, you know, we, we caption all of the, the videos and training things we put out there now and the technology has come so far. It really is not a burden to do it. It's really not hard to do. Um, there are services out there that are really reasonably cost. You know, there's a time not too long ago where it was extremely expensive to have something like that done. It's not that way anymore. Uh, and so there's, there's a captioning service we use. To get, if it's a longer video, if it's a shorter one, we have some technology where we can do it ourselves. Um, but even YouTube has an algorithm that will do it. You have to check it. It's not, yeah, it's yeah. not the best. It, you know, it, it, it's good. I would say it's probably 80%. But even then, you can go in and edit those. So it's completely, completely doable. Yeah, I do all my meetings in Zoom because I had complaints about other services, not to give a plug to Zoom, but they have the auto captioning filter on there. So if I didn't realize somebody that was deaf or hard of hearing was going to be there, at least there's captioning. I may not have had an interpreter at the meeting, but at least, you know, at least we're meeting that minimum and no, is it perfect? No. Um, Would I like it to be? Yes. (laughs) But at least it's a step, right? And that's all we can do is to make a step forward and realize, oh, I can do better. Um, So want to shift gears just slightly because I've known you for a while. One thing I, I love about you is just your personality. Thank your you. Your lightheartedness. Always feel better after talking to you. And we had you as a guest, I think it was last year or maybe a year and a half ago, on our ask, one of our Ask the Experts on humor in the workplace. Yes. And so uh, talk a little bit about that, how you bring humor to the workplace. Well, I wasn't prepared for that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think at the end of the day, we all want to, we, we spend more time with our coworkers than we do with our family. Awake waking hours. If you do the math on it, it's, it, we're with them a lot and we want to enjoy the time we're with there. We all make mistakes. We all goof up the biggest thing at the end of the day. Can we fix it? Most of the time? Yes. And to have a giggle about it, just, yep, screwed that up. So sorry. <laughs> Let me get it fixed. So I've always kind of been a snarky individual. Um, you do kind of have to know your supervisor. I'll put that out there. <laughs> not, not, you do not want to end up in HR, but to have the Gloria come into my office, close the door conversation that's happened to me numerous times that's fine (laughs) but yeah you all want you all want to have a good laugh it makes you feel better it makes your day go faster it makes you enjoy your day so I do if there's a joke to be said um yeah and that's that goes to the culture aspect then as well and and so that's an area where as as a state entity we can compete and we can exceed even a lot of other organizations. So I love that. Thank you for helping the culture in state government. I love the culture. Um, it's the people here that make this job worth it every single day, the people you meet and along the way and that you keep those, you know, I haven't worked for game parks for eight years and I'm still reaching out to them. And, um, yeah, I haven't worked for a department of corrections in I don't know how many years I'm going to date myself if I say, um, so to be able to still remember, oh, they're still there because state government, a lot of times people stay for a long period of time. Yeah. Some of them come get your experience, move on totally okay with that. Um, but a lot of us stay and this is what we do and this is what we love. Yeah. Um, so what has surprised you most about working in government and how do you help overcome some of those, um, thoughts about government out there? Um, I've always said normal is just a setting on a dryer. So we don't do normal. Um, but you know, when you first come in, you, you, I think there's an impression out there that state government workers are lazy and, um, that's, I've never seen, you know, there's always one bad apple, right? And that that's what people see and that's the impression people get. 
But I think with good management, especially here at administrative services, that, you know, they they redirect those employees better than I have seen in other agencies or not agencies, but um, other jobs. And uh, so I think that's huge on, you know, I feel accountable for my job. That makes me do a better job. I have ownership in my job. And I think that's huge. And that goes to the management that says, take ownership of it, make it work. And they know I do a good job and I'm given the freedom to do that good job. And I think that's huge. And so the people I've met here are some of the most dedicated public service workers I've ever met anywhere in any type of job field. Most of them are passionate about what they do and they like their job. And, you know, I I always go back to that family work balance. I couldn't do what I do good during the day if I was worried about how my family was taken care of at night. So that's huge. If I need a day off, I take a day off. My inbox gets a little full, but we we get it done. (laughs) That's one of the things I appreciate most as well is that ability to really, I mean, my family comes first and this I think the role in the state government understands that and there's that balance you're able to find. Yeah, the inbox maybe builds up a little bit, but nothing that the next day can't handle. Um, So that's one great thing about working for the state. What are some of your other favorite benefits or perks that come with your role? We're pretty excited about the new one of kids going to community college, um, getting reimbursed or free. I don't know all the details yet. It's kind of new, but I'm really excited. I got a senior graduate from high school that's really looking at that. Um, so that's a perk. The flexibility in the workplace. Um, I currently work from home every single day. I, I work from home. That's not possible in every field, but there is some people work from home a couple days a week. Some people not at all. Um, it really meets the needs of what you want and, and to look at that and to ask the question if you're looking at state employment, which type of jobs can do that. Um, so I pet my dog and do my job <laughs> and it's great. I also work four nine hour days and on Wednesdays I'm off in the afternoon. So if I have, you know, when you have a lot of kids or a lot of things going on in your life, having that daytime time to be able to take them to appointments without having to use all the leave all the time. So I just know schedule it Wednesday afternoon. I'm good. Um, and to have that flexibility in, in an administration that supports that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I'm very thankful for our leadership within our agency and that flexibility and just being very forward thinking and, and about individuals needs and, and family, you know, as well. Um, you know, you mentioned the community college partnership, um, with the reimbursement there. That's, that's fantastic. And, and what a great way again of setting Nebraska state government apart as an employer, having that perk and that, uh, that benefit. You know, they say one of the taglines is grow Nebraska. And it's so true because not only, you know, even within my job, the training I'm providing to state employees, even if they move on to another job, they're still in Nebraska yeah. and they're still making Nebraska as a whole better. Uh, you know, we're one state that continually wants to improve. And, and I think that's huge. And the community college investment is the same. Even if they don't come to state government to work, they're out there making the state of Nebraska as a whole better. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, so. If there's anyone who's interested in a start, either beginning a career or maybe they're contemplating starting a career with state government, with DAS, or maybe even in in your field, what advice would you give them? Don't mind taking the lower position to move up. You know, I was it was a county accounting clerk in Nebraska is is a pretty lower position. And I was the lowest of the low on accounting clerks, <laughs> but I was able to get the skills I needed because I didn't. Ha- I just had an associate's degree. I didn't have any real life experience for, per se. And um, I was able to slowly but surely move up and get that experience within state government that led me to where I'm at. Um, so, and look at the open jobs. You never know what you might be interested in doing. Um, there's everything you could imagine that you might want to do State government has a piece of it somewhere. Um, if you want to sit on a mower and mow grass, we can hook you up. <laughs> um, you know, if you're into maintenance, there's tons of maintenance jobs. And if you get a maintenance job at the state, look up my email. I'll hook you up with training. Uh, you know, there, there's just any, whether you want to be an accountant and sit behind a desk, whether you want to be out there working on something, whether you're in the medical field, there's anything somebody wants to do. There's some piece of state government that does it. Um, if our listeners are interested in learning more about um, 
the ADA coordinator piece or the 309 task force, or maybe just administrative services, um, where would they find more information? So the DAS website, um, the ADA coordinator is under the director's um, division and uh, 309 task force is under its own division. So you can learn both about those. If you Google ADA coordinator for the state, you'll find me. Are we ready for the hot seat? I believe so. Oh, Are you ready, Gloria? Ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Let's right. go for it. All right. So we'll start off easy. Are you a dog or a cat person? Dog person. Okay. Cats make me sneeze. Yeah. The dog was the right answer, so. It is. <laughs> Absolutely. You may have covered this, but what was your first job, if we haven't? Your what very first job. My okay. very first job, I worked in a daycare. I did the afternoon shift at a daycare. I'd get off school and go watch these little three to five-year-olds. Nebraska Corn Huskers or Creighton Blue Jays? Corn Huskers. Okay. Go Big Red. Go Big Red. Lake McConaughey or the Platte River? Ooh, that's a tough one. So I love Lake McConaughey, but it is a very large beach. So if I'm just going to look, um, that one, but it is a struggle with the wheelchairs. So I'm going to go Platte River because it's close. And we have this joke in our family every time we go to and from Omaha a lot. And we'll message on the way back. I know where I'm at. I'm over the Platte. And <laughs> so I'm going to go Platte River. All right. All right. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite summer food? Oh, I love a good steak on the grill. Yeah. How do you like it prepared? Medium. Medium. Okay. I would go medium rare, but my stomach has now dictated medium. Okay. <laughs> okay. I used to be medium well when I was no, young. No, that's just running against when, steak. When I, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? Okay. Forgive me. I was a child <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't like red mm. in my meat, but the as an adult, stuff. medium rare. Yeah, yeah, medium rare yeah. is probably my favorite, Some but I've kind pepper. of, I've adjusted to, and if it's cooked right, doesn't need much else. No, nope. absolutely. I agree hundred percent. If time travel were possible, would you travel to the future or to the past? I would probably go to the past. I'm scared if I went to the future, I'd want to fix something. Like, where did we go wrong? I got to go back to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> so probably the past. Yeah. I think I'd be the same. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Are you, if you go get an ice cream cone, are you vanilla, chocolate, or twist? Oh, I, I'm going to go vanilla, but I'm all about what you put in the vanilla. Okay. See, I was always chocolate and I still am. And my, all my kids love vanilla and I don't know. That was uh, so my, foreign to me. My favorite is coffee ice cream. Oh, really? Yeah. And I do not like to drink coffee, but oh, in ice funny. cream, I love it. There we go. I, again, normal, just a setting on a dryer. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you had an endless supply of anything, what would it be? Well, gas prices are high. <laughs> <laughs> the gas prices, um, bike tires for this wheelchair, they're so expensive. Um, boy, I don't, probably chocolate, like good chocolate. There you go. Good milk chocolate. Good right. choice. There has to be some in my house at all times. I don't eat a ton of it. But I got to have like one little piece, right? There you go. All right, very good. Um, last one, Amigos or Runza? Oh, I'm going to go with Runza for the Frings. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are good. Yeah. Can't go wrong. Yeah, they're okay. You got to get the dip with the onion rings though. The French onion dip? See, I just, I like them plain. No, you dip. Okay. <laughs> we'll bring it. We'll bring it to the dark side. It's okay. Okay, I'll have to try that. Uh, any final career advice uh, that you would give to our listeners? I think just look out. There's so many jobs available. Look out there if you're looking for something different. If you're if you're trying to balance that family work balance, look at what the state has to offer. You'd be amazed where you could end up. Right. Great advice. Well, Gloria, I want to thank you again for your time today. I know you're busy. Um, thank you as, for having me. As we me. covered, yes. I mean, your typical day is not a typical day. <laughs> I was tired just listening to it. Same. So. I love my job. It's okay. <laughs> so, thank you. We really appreciate thank your you. time. Um, uh, for our listeners, if you want to check out any of the great career opportunities uh, that we talked about today or any others that are out there, including uh, with the Nebraska Department of Administrative Services, encourage you to go out to statejobs.nebraska.gov. And then click on find a state job link. While you are there, you can also check out our links to um, Nebraska state job social media channels on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. 
We would love to have you follow us and learn more about the great career opportunities that are out there. Also, check us out on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and search for Nebraska Department of Administrative Services. And then be sure to hit that subscribe button because that then you'll be notified when we drop our future podcast episodes. So on behalf of our guest, Gloria, my co-host, Caitlin, and myself, Brian, I want to thank you for uh, tuning in today and learning more about the great career opportunities in the good life.